next speaker, Hubertus, has a uh, somewhat controversial proposal. Right. How can you be free with your Bitcoin if you're not free with your banking? Banking on Bitcoin? But wouldn't that print Bitcoin? Wouldn't we have paper Bitcoin? Just, well, I think we're about to find out. I'm not, why should I bother answering? I'm feeling really triggered right now. <laughs> How about everyone out there? We'll get him set up. He'll get the projector going, or projector, and uh, we'll be set. Okay. Let's give him a round of applause and a welcome. Thank you. Uh, I need to see if the uh, notes.
Yeah. So, good afternoon. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, let's jump right straight in the matter to, in the matter to catch up on time. Some of you here may still remember, out of from personal experience, the time when the great financial crisis went on, which was around when Bitcoin was launched, and um, marked was this whole period by the collapse of, of Lehman Brothers. And it was a time of large bank bailouts, as we all know, and which triggered quite big criticism in the society because uh, people said, oh, the government is socializing cost, which was caused by the irresponsibility and ir recklessness of bankers. So <clears throat> there was indeed, let's say, a grain of truth in, in that story. Because yes, in the run-up to the financial crisis, the banks did make huge profits. And yes, the executives did get big bonuses. So everybody hated them for them. Because it's very normal if there's a crime that people ask cui bono, yeah? who, who benefits from the thing. And it seemed to be the banks. However, there's a big difference between a normal crime and a crime against the laws of economics. Because very often in, when things go wrong in economics, it's often a secondary effect of some primary reaction somebody did with good intentions. And these, good, good, these actions are most often by government. Um, uh, at the time, I was called into a working group in, in Parliament to help a working group to, to work out measures so that such a situation couldn't ever repeat again. And so I, I was already independent at the time, and my colleagues on the committee were, let's say, mostly economists and government employee. So uh, when I came to rather different conclusions about this whole situation to them, uh, there was a very funny reaction. Between what, because what I found was that while the banks were superficially at fault, it was actually the government and regulations and policies which triggered a kind of automatism which the banks couldn't really avoid if they wanted to be successful or even just stay in business. To give you some examples, uh, for example, it was the politicians who put in place a regulation that certain financial institutions could only invest in securities which three rating agencies rated with a good rating, AAA. And what that caused, however, I mean, this was good intentions because what they wanted was to protect savers against reckless investment by those institutions. Sounds good, but what it actually did was it disempowered the own credit risk management departments in these institutions, but essentially the investment managers followed these ratings. If the rating agencies said, it's AAA, then was AAA invested in. And as we all know today, rating agencies can make mistakes, and they did. And particularly, they can make mistakes if there are some incentives in place, which, um, so to say, cause them to make this in place, like, like fees which are to be being paid. But it was the politicians which forced the regulatory framework, which everybody had to follow, which made this possible and gave rating agencies this power. So uh, there were actually a number of these policies which made things go wrong, like, for instance, the deduction of mortgage interest, which means the more loan you have, the less tax you pay, so you maximize indebtedness, which changed America. It used to be a nation of savers. And, of course, there was also the subprime loan guarantees, which essentially caused that banks, which were covered by these guarantees, could make reckless loan decisions. Was it their fault? Debatable. So, what that caused, however, was um, the politicians didn't want to hear that story. Yeah? They only wanted to have stories and narratives which put the whole blame on the bankers. Uh, the banks must be regulated, was the slogan at the time. Occupy Wall Street. Yeah? Uh, just as if it hadn't been originally regula regulations which had caused the whole trouble. So, and what they certainly didn't want to become known, that it wasn't really the bankers which were at fault, but that it was the politicians who now claimed the glory of having saved the day, the economy and the banks. I'm just telling you that because there is a certain, let's say, antagonism sometimes against banking, which I think is overplayed. And when we talk about free banking, I'm talking about a form of banking which will be possible with Bitcoin, but government just doesn't get a say. That said, they still have a lot of other things they can do, like tax policy, 
which muck up things. So let's go back to 2008, nine. So when Bitcoin appeared on the scene, uh, it was very interesting to uh, observe the progress because there were great hopes. People thought it would fix inflation yeah, and keep politicians out of a particularly sensitive part of banking, which is issue banking. Yeah, so I started to think about some of these um, questions which you see here. Can, can Bitcoin protect money issue and credit against politicians messing it up? Partly. Will banking change and how? Um, will this be beneficial for the economy? Will it grow more? Will we prosper more? And last but not least, of course, what does it mean for Bitcoin and for its future value? I mean, everybody's an investor. So what happened next was there was a certain reality check. So there was 1913, the Cyprus crisis, where the government simply haircut uh, savings accounts and took some money for themselves. And that looked like it fitted in this narrative, which is still around today, yeah, that Bitcoin fixes everything, because Bitcoin usage in Cyprus did pick up at the time. But then came Greece. So... Uh, and, and there something happened, despite a referendum of 62% of people voting against the EU measures, the EU was simply able, the EZB was able to cut off the money stream to the, to the country, the government had to close the banks, people couldn't get cash out of the cash machines, people couldn't buy, couldn't buy food, couldn't buy medicine, couldn't pay the doctor. So it's a harsh situation, after two weeks, government caved in, signed the contract which nobody wanted and the EZB cash kept rolling and however for me there was a situation which where I had to kind of evaluate the narrative that Bitcoin fixes everything against the reality uh, what actually happened. And so I developed this theory that Bitcoin was only half finished. We had looked at the money side of things well enough but not at the credit side and it's always money credit going together. And so I, I personally didn't do much in Bitcoin after that time. We discussed it a bit at the Austrian Economic Seminar in Vienna at the Hayek Institute. And we came to the conclusion that without this credit thing, it couldn't really succeed. And it, what happened afterwards kind of confirmed the situation. Like the situation in Argentina, I think, is known. Yes, people use Bitcoin a little bit. But even Javier Millet, who is an Austrian economist, promised to dollarize the country instead of Bitcoinizing it. There was Lebanon, where the, the where shenanigans going on with the central bank governor. Uh, what are they doing? They're not de-Bitcoinizing. It's used a little bit, but the meetup in, in Lebanon is very small. Most people keep dollar. And, and now Zimbabwe, the, le the last one, they are thinking about a gold currency. So they are not Bitcoinizing. And to me, that was completely logical, because Bitcoin is still missing a half. Um, I was concerned with other things at the time, but um, because inflation is picking up, we had new bank runs, we started thinking about that again in Vienna about a year and a half, two years ago. But before I tell about that, let's talk about issue banking. Yeah? So we, today we know the issue banking, the issuing of banknotes only in its, let's say, perverted form as, as a government monopoly to issue inflationary fiat money. So let's look at the alternative, which is free banking. On issue banking itself, we must know that it's a hugely profitable industry. And to give you an example, the US Federal Reserve has total assets of about 8 trillion US dollars, and they're making a profit of about 100 billion dollars, actually 107 billion dollars uh, in 2022. The total assets of uh, world central banks, which we can take as a proxy, as the value of total money required to grease the world trade exchange is 44 trillion. So this is a lot of money, um, and which also means that in fighting this system or in, in superseding these systems, it's pretty much catch as catch can. So we have to, and we know that we're going to have huge resistance here. And central banking worldwide essentially has the hallmarks of a socialist undertaking. Central banking, because it's a central planner thing. It's not free market. It removes the market creation from the free market mechanism, which is possible. And this is made possible by three rules. Essentially, to, to enforce such a thing, government needs to do three things. They must declare that only one bank in the country has the power to issue money and nobody else, which is why they hate Bitcoin. You need a law which forces citizens to accept that money at face value, whether it's worth it or not. And third, the 
there is no obligation for the central bank to redeem that money into gold coins or, or anything of value, really. So they can issue it for buying government bonds, which no government in reality is ever going to go back, pay back. If we go back a little bit in history, um, when this was actually introduced in Germany and Austria in, in the 1920s, the national banks immediately to made, take advantage of that and by printing more and more and more money in these early days. Uh, and while the gold content in Austria and Germany was actually brought down because they had to pay war reparations in gold. So uh, they printed it out of thin air, government bonds, which resulted in the well-known hyperinflation in Germany where, as the, the subline here says, it was better to burn paper money than to buy the firewood with it, which you can burn. Now, this can work in the big of schemes, a big uh, scheme of things, yeah? For a while, because once politicians abuse the system, it won't, and they always do in the end. So they print too much money and we get price inflation. They set interest rates artificially low to fund government um, deficits. This again increases asset prices, um, which makes houses unaffordable, which increases the gap between the rich and the poor. Um, it requires fractional reserve banking where money creation can get out of hand because it's an artificial mechanism which is akin to a, let's say, elastic band which nobody can really steer anything with. And with CBDCs around the corner, it also, I mean, we need, don't need to talk about it, it makes possible mass surveillance and control. Even though, I mean, knowing some of the people who are doing that at the EZB, they have the best intentions and they're going to construct it all perfectly in the, in the beginning, but we know how things can evolve over time. Now, so what we are going to talk to be about today is issue banking. And it's very important to understand that it has nothing to do with deposit banking, mortgage banking, uh, investment banking, all the upstream forms of banking. This is really just about the core banking of, of creating credit money. Now, free competition happens in the free banking system. So there's no monopoly. There's free choice in currency. If a free bank decides to create another cur currency than Bitcoin credit, we have to admit it. Yeah, it's, it's allowed. There must be competition so that the best currency prevails, as Hayek said, in alternative currencies. Um, the decision of how much money is supplied will be a free market decision of those people who need money pay a certain minting fees and means asking for money. And so it doesn't need central bank regulators, central planners to decide what the quantity of money would be by manipulating interest rates. And it must, must be redeemable in Bitcoin instead of um, nothing. So, and important, as I said, never confuse issue banking with the other forms of banking because today these banks, these banking institutions do confuse it. They do also create money, but they shouldn't. And we'll come to that. So is such a system hypothetically? No. Uh, as a matter of fact, it isn't even that new. We had 50 countries in the world which had free banking at some time or the other. And some of them even had it for more than 100 years before government came along and uh, usurped this uh, rather lucrative business. The last free case of free banking, which I personally know of, was in a little town in Austria called Virgil, in Tyrol, in the middle of the mountains, where in the midst of the Great Depression, the mayor created a free money against the law. But in midst all the despair of the Great Depression, this little village experienced an enormous growth spurt and a decline in, in unemployment, while the rest of the country really went down the train, drain. And it produced, so to say, a short-lived economic um, miracle until government, so to say, came with police and put the guy away. Uh, and a film about this story has a very interesting um, scene which really explains how credit money is different from base money, base Bitcoin. So let's, let's have a look at that. It's, it has its subtitles. Sorry, guys. Oh. Sound? Sound? Well, so I'll, I'll speak it, yeah? Imagine the following. Guest comes to our town and goes to Zenza and wants a room. 
Asks for a room. He gets the key. So the hotel manager goes to the shop and pays his debt. She pays the butcher. Und der Toni geht mit dem Hunderter zu Gerti und gibt ihr endlich ihr Geld. He, be he pays his lady friend. Und die Gerti geht zum Zenzer, legt ihm den Hunderter auf den Tisch und zahlt ihm die Zimmer, die sie immer reinnimmt. Lady friend needs a room in the hotel once in a while. Am Schluss kommt der Gast grantig von oben, sagt, das Zimmer gefällt mir nicht, nimmt den Hunderter, der da liegt und geht. Yeah, so poof. That's credit money. It's very different to commodity money. So in economist language, we call base money M0. That would be Bitcoin in the future system. And elastic credit money is called M1. This elastic credit money supply is still missing in Bitcoin. We only have M0. But it's urgently needed if you want Bitcoin to succeed. Even here in El Salvador, I hear here that the actual usage, apart from some fans like us, is actually still minimal. And it's clear because the credit money supply breathes. Yeah? In the, and the, like the economy has a constantly changing demand for money. Before Christmas, it's higher. Uh, yeah, after population growth, it's higher. If there are new inventions, it gets, if, the, if the division of labor changes, it gets higher. So um, if done correctly, the total purchasing power of the base money will always remain constant. There will be no deflation and there will be no inflation. On that basis, Bitcoin banking has to be full reserve banking because the M0 quantity and the M1 quantity must be sufficient and all the other forms of upstream uh, banking are not allowed to produce money. Why? Um, let's have a first, before we go into the why, let's have a look at inflation. As long as the gold standard was in power, uh, was sort of valid, I think most of us know that there was a pretty constant purchasing power of, for instance, the British pound. Slightly in, uh, deflating because of a small construction mistake in the gold standard. And only after 2014, when the gold redeemability was abolished, we have the well-known in this, in this room uh, inflationary effect, which ate away the value of money. For instance, some of us may know the book, The Wisdom of Crowds of uh, Soroyevsky, the famous oxen of Francis, Sir Francis Galton with his experiment about wisdom of the crowd, which weighed 1,200 pounds cost 37 pounds and about two, three weeks ago I was in London in a restaurant and guess what I paid for one steak of 250 gram, 37 pounds. So that's kind of gives you an, a, a relationship of what's happening here. In America it was similar. You see a very stable purchasing power of, of gold currency. Essentially gold was worth $20 for an, a, a gold coin for a long, long period of time. And the only times when this was actually not the case, it actually confirms this stability. Because what happened here, yeah, that they financed those two wars, they set out redeemability, gold not redeemable, you print our banknotes against war bonds, and you, you, when we give you war bonds, you, you print the money to buy them. And that, of course, inflated the money supply, you get a bit of inflation, war was over, yeah, this, they in, he introduced redeemability, and purchasing power recovered. Twice this pattern. Now, let's, let's jump 100 years into the future, into just the financial crisis. Yeah, here you can see the foundation of um, the, the release of uh, Bitcoin. Uh, the central banks did not have the power to leave the 2% inflationary target, by which they steal our money at just 2% per year. They had to always bring it back to the 2% target, but that changed with the recession which was looming in 2015 when they started the asset price purchase program and started to increase the, uh, the money supply, M0, the supposed uh, base money. 
And then came the COVID politics situation, which had to be financed. And you can see how wild uh, they started printing money to, fin to finance reckless government spending and, and measures in that period. So for any, anybody with a sense, you don't need to be an economist to see what happens. This situation was in the middle of 2022. And I guess some of us may know what this lady said four months later. No? Oh. She's, can I have sound? Inflation has um, just pretty much come about from nowhere. <laughs> can I play it again? <laughs> Inflation has um, just pretty much come about from nowhere. This is, this is so great. Anyway, so um, how will a Bitcoin system solve that? Let's look first at the sound basis of money creation. I mean, I guess we can all agree here that gold and silver is not that bad about money creation. Neither is Bitcoin. Yeah, and if we are honest, even other crypto tokens with a fixed supply would qualify as an M1. Yeah, but they don't have the social consensus of being the one. Yeah, what, we are, what we are here, we are social consensus that Bitcoin is the one. It's a, it's a decision. It's not given. The other thing which is very often overlooked uh, is that real goods, which have been already produced, are just as much a good basis for the emission of a medium of exchange because these things need to be exchanged. So you need a medium of exchange to grease the trade in them. Um, so what is not a good backing for money is anything which is only future production, which will be created then, like government bonds, like company shares in the so-called Lombard business, very bad money issuing business, or of course financial bills, because there's not only trade bills, again, paying real goods, there can be also financial bills of exchange. So printing money against future value will invariably cause inflation if it is in excess of the demand of trade and industry. So you, you can print it on wrong basis, but then you need to really watch out what you're doing, particularly if you have monetary policy in the hands of a central planner. Now, one other thing which is important to know, and very people appreciate, this, this, that there's a difference between a discount rate and between an interest rate. Even though mathematically they look the same, but from an economist's point of view, they're very different. A discount rate is something that you pay less for a good which already exists and has, been, uh, and has a value, whereas an interest rate is a share of something in the future which you possibly get if it is successful. And if not, you, you have a credit default. So let's look at the instru instrument by which we want to do it. The, the bill of exchange uh, is a time-tested private means of money creation, peer-to-peer. -peer. And it has been that for many hundred years till about the 1980s. I still worked with some of these things in Citibank. And they are being issued when a buyer and a seller of some real good already produced Negotiate a price for it, the seller wants more, the, buyer, the seller wants more, the buyer wants to pay less. And then pay with these goods with a bill of exchange. And then they create private, non-inflationary medium of exchange for that. So looking at that, so what happened before 1914 was you had an elastic issue of banknotes on, on gold coin. And in Bitcoin, let's have a look, yeah. Um, when issuing, so, so what banks essentially did is they stored gold coins and emissioned uh, banknotes against it and the discounted real bills and issued banknotes against it. And, and that kept the va value of money stable. And, and in, in Bitcoin, the missing part is exactly that. So let's talk about that. Bills of exchange are actually a very secure form of private money. They have a guarantee chain Every time it's being passed on, the subsequent person can go to the, his prior man if the actual payer in the beginning fails to pay. So if the credit risk, for instance, on the first pay is 10%, you actually, this is actually reduced to 10% of 10% in the second step, which is 1%, and so on and so forth. 0.1 in the end, it's hardly an, a, a, a rounding error. Just in the base instrument without any further guarantees. 
So this made the instrument quite secure, and particularly once it had changed hands once or twice, uh, the risk for the holder was practically null. So, and that's why Bitcoin credit money, minted and then guaranteed by mint, need not pay interest, in fact, should not pay interest, because that would make the system unstable. In a Bitcoin credit system, mints grant credit lines to these e-bills, verify that everything is correct. Everything must be verified, that's very important. Only we can do that. The old banks were a black box there, the discount houses. But here, every single e-bill e is an atomic um, creation of money. And they must guarantee the payment in case anything goes wrong in the holder chain because we cannot expect retail holders of e-cash tokens to wait until these guys in the, in the wholesale money have sorted out the issues. The mints have to cough up the money immediately if anything goes wrong on the wholesale uh, changer. Because at maturity, the money uh, to redeem the e-cash tokens against Bitcoin has to be paid by the payer of the original e-bill. Uh, and by the way, this redemption requires just one single transaction on the on the Bitcoin blockchain, but that one is very important because it keeps the system honest and makes sure that there has been really value going around. Now let's look at what this does to privacy. I, I mean, I'll spare you. Uh, I, 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 is there anybody for CBDCs here? <laughs> okay. Okay. I, I don't need to tell you. So, um, but, but uh, let's also look at what the people think. So interestingly, the, here it's very hard to convince the people of something stupid. So the Americans, for instance, in a recent uh, research by the Carter Institute voted, so to say, 81% against uh, CBDCs. And even in Europe, which is more bureaucratic, 66% of people against it. So that's actually a good opportunity, an unexpected opportunity, if we can do better on privacy, to win against the fiat system. But right now, of course, we're very traceable. But how is that going to be with credit money? Um, once you have, let's go here, yeah, once you have... Once you are in the Xiaomi and eCash part, where the eCash e tokens minted from eBills are fluctuating between people, there's absolutely no trace of what's happening in between here. And whatever gets written on the chain at the very end is, so to say, a three-month-long free mixing process. So you don't actually need mixers anymore. Uh, but, I mean, while we have that, I think we have a problem. Because the political situation is, is such that it would possibly be required. For me, that also means we need to fight the moral law. I mean, at some stage, Bitcoiners have to be founding a Bitcoin party or something to get our philosophy of privacy back into the legal system. For instance, in Austria, we had perfect banking secrecy. Bank accounts could be anonymous. Um, since the 1930s. They were introduced in a time, in difficult political times, when the political opposition had to have fear that the money would be confiscated um, and, and uh, yeah, ethnic minorities, so they had to fear. And it was perfectly legal until 20 years ago when the EU came and forced Austria to re relinquish it. Yeah? And other professions still have secrecy. Yeah? There's professional secrecy uh, for accountants, for instance. So if they really wanted to, ta to find tax dodgers, please be my guest and put cameras into accountants' offices to catch many more tax dodgers. Or put microphones in the confessionals of the priests in the, uh, in the churches. Lots of crimes being uh, reported there. So we don't want that. So uh, the next thing we need to look at, is this going to be full reserve or fractional reserve? There's, because there is, uh, uh, as, as you know, Austrians have always been very much against fractional reserve because it, you can't control reasonably the money supply for it. And in a Bitcoin system, there's something now which will surprise you, but please bear with me because it can be explained mathematically. If the reserves which the mints had to, had to hold for this payment when a, bit, and when a bill of change goes wrong, had to be in Bitcoin, the mints would suck in all the Bitcoin which is out there in the public with us. And the more this happens, the less elastic the money would be till in the end, it's just as inelastic as, as before. So one of the, the things which was very controversial when I presented it in, in Graz in Austria a month ago, was that this needs 
a second token and Bitcoiners are not used to having a second token. Now, obviously, if you're putting this on, on uh, the, the, the main chain, um, and the only currently available option for that is BRC, which uh, Giacomo, whom I'm going to be debating tomorrow, doesn't like very much. But at the same time, at this moment, it works. And as soon as some of the other positive solutions comes around, could be Taproot Assets, RGB, or maybe even Casey's runes get, get ready at any time soon. So it will swap over to a better token, which does less problems to the, to the main chain. But it needs to be on Bitcoin main chain. We don't want to be on any other chain. Um, so, uh, yeah, so th these tokens must be temporarily sold by mints whenever there is a fault. So they get a Bitcoin payment and to send it to exactly the same taproot address, which redeems the eCash tokens. And once they got the money back from the payer, they can repurchase EIU from Bit for Bitcoin, which means the Bitcoin system is again equalized and imbalanced and can have a stable value. Um, the, the EIU tokens are issued pretty much like, like, e, uh, like Bitcoin itself. So anybody who contributes to the project uh, is, takes part in the three months contribution. The contribution is 42 million, goes to anybody who works for the project. So it's kind of a brute of work. There's no way to get it without working. And it's declining by 4.2% every quarter, which, Im which implies a halving every four years, just like Bitcoin. So in about 130 years, the last one of these things will be created for whoever contributes then. But the mints will also have to burn um, um, EIU when they create credit money. So uh, that secures the system. That also gives us a chance to talk about the future value of Bitcoin, because we know that the total central banks, I mentioned that, have a total um, assets of 44 trillion today. And we know from history, from around the 1820s to the 1870s, that the ratio of base money to credit money at the time was 1 to 10. So for every gold coin, there were 10 banknotes worth a gold coin. That's needed to keep the economy of 1820 going, and arguably it would be even more because the, the economy has, uh, has uh, modernized a bit more. So that means 10% of 44 trillion is 4.4 uh, trillion divided by 21 million Bitcoin means that when Bitcoin reaches its real value, implying the expectation that Bitcoin win the world, it's going to be worth $210,000 per Bitcoin today's value. Yeah, that's important to keep in mind. For, interestingly, for the guarantee, we also have historic numbers. So the discount banks, the mints of old, needed to hold about 10% uh, reserve capital for the credit money they issued, which of the remainder 39.6 trillion is also for 4 trillion in value. And since we're going to have in 130 years 1 billion of these things, uh, an EIU token would ultimately be worth $4,000 if the whole world adopts Bitcoin. If it's only 50% of GDP, you can calculate that down. But it's the expectation, by the way, which counts here. And the business which is generated for mints it's open source software, yeah? so anybody can, can uh, download the software on a mint. At 4% per annum, the mints can earn $1.6 trillion. So that's essentially my talk. Um, if, you, yeah, if, if you want to, so to say, um, participate, it would be great. I'm here because we're looking for devs, for developers, for documentation people, for people who educate businesses because the target audience for credit money is businesses. And uh, yeah, I uh, look forward to speaking to any of you who is interested to learn more about the project. Thank you. Do we have